Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the McGowan Theater located in the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum, and I'm also the producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Before we begin today's program, I just have a couple of brief announcements. I hope you'll join us this Friday, February 27th, for our final program celebrating Black History Month. At noon, history professor Allison Hobbs will be on hand to discuss her book, A Chosen Exile, A History of Racial Passing in American Life. Then on Wednesday, March 4th at noon, William G. Hyland will present a talk on his book, Martha Jefferson, An Intimate Life with Thomas Jefferson. This is the first and only biography on the life of Martha Jefferson, who died an untimely death at the age of 33. And finally, on Friday, March 6th, the National Archives Museum will open its newest exhibit, Spirited Republic, Alcohol in American History. To launch this new exhibit opening, okay. <laughs> there will be tastings, yes. <laughs> Not on that day, but there will be tastings uh, over the year. Uh, let's see, to launch, <laughs> to launch this new opening, we'll have a special noon author talk on that day, Mint Juleps with Teddy Roosevelt, The Complete History of Presidential Drinking by journalist and author Mark Will Weber. To find out more about these and our other public programs and exhibits, please take one of our monthly event calendars, which you'll find in the racks in the theater lobby, or you can visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. You'll also find in the theater lobby copies of an article on today's speaker, which may be found in the current issue of the National Archives Quarterly Magazine Prologue. You'll also find prologue applications should you wish to subscribe and receive copies of our magazine in the mail. Our speaker today is David O. Stewart, author of Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America. After practicing law for many years, Mr. Stewart turned to writing history. His first book, The Summer of 1787, The Men Who Invented the Constitution, was a Washington Post bestseller and won the Washington Writing Award as best book of 2007. Two years later, Impeached, The Trial of President Andrew Johnson and the Fight for Lincoln's Legacy was a David Kidd bestseller. The Society of the Cincinnati awarded David in 2013 its History Prize for American Emperor Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America, an examination of Burr's Western Expedition, which shook the nation's foundations at a time when those foundations were none too solid. The Lincoln Deception, a historical mystery about the John Wilkes Booth conspiracy, was released in late August of 2013. Bloomberg View called it the best historical novel of the year, while Publishers Weekly called it an impressive debut novel. The Wilson Deception, a sequel to this novel, will be released later this year. David is also president of the Washington Independent Review of Books and Online Book Review. Please join me in welcoming David O. Stewart back to the National Archives. Thank you very much, Doug, and thank you all for coming out here um, on this braving the cold and ice. Uh, I am reminded many Februaries of something my father would always say, which is if you get through February, the rest of the year is easy. Um, and this February, I feel it acutely. Um, I want to talk today, of course, about James Madison. Uh, I became fascinated with Madison. In, you've heard I've, I've done some work in this era, time period before. Uh, I became fascinated because, for two reasons. First was that he was so central to the nation's founding. Um, I finally became persuaded, really, that he was more central to the founding of the nation than anyone else other than George Washington. Washington, of course, is the most pivotal figure of our history. But Madison, I think, is the next figure. And if you look at the list of his achievements, you get a feel for this, I think. First, of course, is the calling of the Constitutional Convention in 1787 at a time when the nation really was at risk of falling apart. Uh, the writing of the Constitution at that convention. The Federalist Papers, which were written to in, uh, support the ratification of the, convention, uh, of the Constitution. Um, he then led the battle for ratification itself. He was the leading member of the first Congress, uh, which established the new government. Um, he wrote the Bill of Rights, 
and secured their adoption. I'm only halfway through my list yet. Uh, he was co-founder of the first American political party, then called the Republican Party. In the pivotal election of 1800, he was the co-architect of the transfer of government from the Federalist Party of John Adams to the Thomas Jefferson as leader of the Republicans. It's many times said that the true test of a uh, representative government is if you can have a peaceful transfer of power between contending parties, and we did achieve that in 1800. That's when we came of age. He was Secretary of State for the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the nation. He was our first wartime president through the War of 1812, not a, always a glorious chapter in our history, but one that was ended successfully enough, I suppose, is the best way to say it. And he was perhaps our only two-term president who had a better second term than first term. Now think about that and think about your own life uh, and the presidents you've known who've served two terms. It's very tough to have a good second term. And Madison, when he left office, was really acclaimed around the country. He was, he'd had some very difficult times through the war, but the country was flourishing. Peace uh, had brought tremendous benefits. And he, he ended up be, being, of all of our presidents, the president for whom the most cities, counties, and municipalities are named, more even than Washington or Franklin. So we have this tremendous list of achievements, but then there is the undeniable fact that Madison is often ignored. I found myself telling my editor that I think of him sometimes as the zealot of the founding. He's there, but he's not really noticed. So that's an interesting question, why? Um, there's a flip answer. He was short, he was skinny, he had a soft voice. This is a picture, a, a, an artist's rendition of the Constitutional Convention. And there he is, next to, Matt, uh, next to Washington at the front, holding a pen. That's how you can tell he's got a quill pen. You can pick out Madison there. And yet, yeah, he's short and he's skinny, he's got a receding hairline. He had a soft voice. And in rooms that were filled with noisy people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, or with large and charismatic men like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. Madison was pretty easy to miss. It's a flip answer, but I think there's something to that, actually. But there's another answer, too. He was different from most great leaders. We think of great leaders most often as men most often men, but women too, who have strong streaks of narcissism. They need to be at the front of the parade. They prefer to be on a white horse or in a big convertible. They crave recognition and acclaim. Madison had none of those qualities. He disliked public events. He never became comfortable at them. At his first inaugural ball. This is the pinnacle of his political career. He has become president of the United States, a nation he did so much to found. And he goes to the great party, and a friend greets him and, and congratulates him warmly, and Madison says, uh, thank you very much, but I would rather be home in bed. <laughs> uh, he was a man who cared about results, not applause, about making the American experiment in self-government a success about realizing the promise of the revolution that was what he gave, dedicated his career to. And I became very interested in a tribute from a longtime colleague who wrote, under all circumstances, Madison was collected and ever mindful of what was due from him to others and cautious not to wound the feelings of anyone. It doesn't sound like a lot of great leaders, does it? ever mindful of what was due from him to others. My impression is they're a lot more mindful of what is due from us to them, and that they are not necessarily cautious not to wound the feelings of anyone. As I continued to examine Madison's remarkable contributions, it became clear to me that he never really operated alone, or at least very rarely did. His greatest achievements were really the fruit of partnerships. And it seemed to me that it was almost as though he had taken 
what today would be called a modern personality assessment, the sort of thing organizations like their people to do and turn them into extroverts, introverts, ISGJEs, or whatever. And that Madison was able to conclude that he was, in fact, short and skinny, and he had a soft voice, and he had zero charisma. But if he was doing an honest self-assessment, he would have noticed some real powerful positives. He was smarter than almost anybody he met. He had a rare appetite for hard work. He had a gift for making contact and connecting with people. And extraordinary political judgment and foresight. So why not take those gifts and marry them to someone else who has the gifts he doesn't have? Now, we don't know that Madison actually did that, made such an assessment, stared at the mirror for the requisite period of seconds. But I found that the concept provided a clarifying lens through which to look at his extraordinary career. He was a man who understood the power of partnership. Immodestly, I would even suggest that there are some important lessons from his style that can be applied to any era of political life, but maybe particularly to our era as well. I became persuaded that the best way to think about Madison was in terms of five central partnerships. Some of them waxed and waned through his career. He had a long public career, 40 years. Um, and they were formed with very different people. The first is with Alexander Hamilton, a very different character. Hamilton was flashy. He was charismatic. He was effectively orphaned at age 13. He came from nothing, uh, came from uh, Fly Speck Island on, uh, in the Caribbean, had to make his own way in the world. Madison, by contrast, was a fortunate son, the inheritor of a great estate, the eldest son of a man who owned 5,000 acres of Virginia uh, land. He never had his own home until he was 43 just would live in rooming houses or go back to Montpelier. He lived with his mom until he was 78. Dolly was very tolerant. <laughs> uh, but they recognized something in each other when they first met each other as the young, two youngest men serving in the Confederation Congress. This is in 1783 when we we're still operating under the Articles of Confederation. I think they recognized in each other first great intelligence. Between them, they definitely were the two smartest men in the room. But also a shared impatience to make the United States a great nation and a true nation, which in 1783 we really weren't. There was much talk and serious talk that we should simply form three nations. New England and the Middle States and the South would be separate nations, sort of like Europe, maybe even a fourth nation on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Hamilton, who took a backseat to nobody for impatience, had first decreed the need to have a national convention to rewrite the Articles of Confederation before the Articles had even been adopted. But Madison came along after a couple of years and agreed with him that that was the only practical way to deal with the problems that the country was having. They collaborated in a campaign to call the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787. And then they collaborated again, most importantly, in the campaign to ratify the Constitution. We often forget what a close struggle that was. They jointly wrote the Federalist Papers. They wrote, it, wrote them as a propaganda piece but they've endured as really the finest writing about political theory, political philosophy that any Americans have ever produced. And then they went out as practical politicians and each won ratification in their conventions, Madison in Virginia and Hamilton in New York. The second partner is, of course, George Washington, 
And Madison would never be a peer of Washington. Nobody was a peer of Washington. Washington wouldn't have that. He was the great man of America. He had won the Revolutionary War. There's a wonderful anecdote that when King George III heard that Washington, after winning the war, had resigned his commission and gone back to be a farmer at Mount Vernon, the king had said, if that's true, he's the greatest man in the world. And Washington had won extraordinary trust of every American, not only by winning the war, but then by be being willing to give up power. He was the trump card of American politics. Madison could see that, and he could see that if he was an ally of George Washington, the things he wanted to get done could get done better. So Washington was the indispensable man, so Madison made himself the indispensable man to the indispensable man. When Washington wanted legislation through the Virginia Assembly, involving the development of the Potomac River or anything else, Madison would make it happen. He would be the leader. If he needed legislation through Congress, the Confederation Congress, Madison would make that happen too. And over a period of five years, Madison became Washington's closest political confidant. He spent days at Mount Vernon just closeted with the general. Washington's diary, and he always kept a diary his whole life, would simply say, spent today in conversation with Mr. Madison. Indeed, during the first conf uh, Congress, Madison is often referred to as having served as Washington's prime minister. Their most important achievement, most durable achievement, I think, was the Bill of Rights. Now, there's a wonderful moment in Washington's first administration when he's just coming to office. He needs an inaugural address, so he asks Madison to write him an inaugural address, which is done, and it asks for only one thing, a Bill of Rights, Const constitutional amendments to protect individual rights. Congress wants to write an answer to Washington as a gesture of respect, so they ask Madison to write the answer. <laughs> well, Washington's a little flustered, so he wants to write a courteous reply, so he asks Madison to write the reply. <laughs> the early government was in many ways a conversation among Madison. <laughs> but the Bill of Rights comes the closest to being Madison's solo achievement. He wrote them, he got them through Congress, he made it happen, but he also made it happen with Washington's essential support. Now the third figure is Thomas Jefferson, in many ways his only real, his, his soulmate. They came from the same background, they grew up 30 miles apart in Virginia's Piedmont country, both from the same background. Jefferson inherited his 3,000 acres when he was 14, not when he was 49, that was their biggest difference. They were both bookworms, both interested in everything, both knew something about almost everything. Their correspondence to each other is a delight. <laughs> they write about everything, science, philosophy, uh, animals, crops, and politics. Um, they agreed on most political questions, but they had a different style many times. Jefferson was more the visionary. He was not so good on details. Madison had a very analytical mind and was extremely good at that sort of thing. And Jefferson adopted a practice through his career of when he would have an interesting idea that excited him, he would first run it by Madison. And Madison was not shy about saying, usually in a very polite way, that's a wonderful idea, but have you thought about these nine problems with it? and Jefferson would take his advice. They both became very disenchanted with Hamilton's financial system. This is the great switch. Madison enters Congress as George Washington's prime minister, but after a year and then some, he discovers that the Secretary of the Treasury has a financial program that he can't support, and nor can Jefferson as Secretary of State and so Madison goes into opposition with Jefferson in order to, order to oppose the Hamiltonian policy, which they found unduly centralized the government. They thought it introduced financial instability. We had a number of financial panics under the Hamiltonian system. 
they had to create a political vehicle for this opposition. And although they both despised partisan politics, they created our first political party. I think they would both be appalled to be remembered for it. But they did it. They did it very assiduously and very well. And then they did win the 1800 election, as I mentioned. And their party dominated American politics for the next six decades. Now, Monroe was a bit of a revelation to me. I had not studied him much. I was really discouraged at first to discover just how many people who were his contemporaries and felt it necessary to recall that he really was a little dim. Um, this was not what I was looking for. Um, he was a military type. He had been a soldier as a very young man in the Revolution. He always had a military bearing. He was a strapping six-footer, charismatic, um, not an intellectual. His letters with Madison are friendly, they're warm, they're collegial. He was a very canny politician, but we don't get a lot of political philosophy. This is not what James Monroe did. They were sometimes rivals. Uh, indeed, they ran against each other in the first election for Congress in 1789. They are the only future presidents who ever opposed each other for a lower office. Um, it was a bit of gerrymandering. Patrick Henry had actually set it up so Madison would have to run against Monroe. Henry had a real vendetta against Madison and was hoping to get him beaten. Madison won fairly handily. But then nearly 20 years later, when Madison is a candidate for president, Monroe stands as a candidate against him and actually is on the ballot in 1808. He's not a serious candidate, but it was a measure that they had had a serious falling out after many years of close relationship. And indeed, indeed, they didn't speak for two years or have any contact at all. But Madison reached a point as president in his first administration when he thought it was essential that the United States go to war with Britain. Britain had been seizing our ships at sea for years as a result of the Napoleonic conflict. They had been taking our sailors uh, and impressing them into the British Navy. And Madison simply thought for our own self-esteem, for our own respectability as a nation, we could no longer just take it. But Madison was not a man anybody would think of as a military sort. He needed somebody to put a little steel into his administration. And Monroe was the perfect character. He had great experience in Europe as well and credibility as a diplomat. He had negotiated the Louisiana Purchase. So he reached out to Monroe. They were able to patch up their differences. He brought Monroe into his administration as Secretary of State, where he was an essential pillar of the government through the war. In fact, for periods of the war, he served as both Secretary of State and Secretary of War simultaneously, a fairly neat trick. Now, his final partner is the one I want to talk about most, and in as many ways, the most interesting one. And that's Dolly, of course, his wife of 42 years. She was the star. Madison would never be the star. It just wasn't in his skill set. Um, she brought charisma and warmth, great charm. Well, Madison hated the spotlight. Dolly bloomed in the spotlight. She loved it. She was a natural. She started out in life as Dolly Payne. And like James, she grew up on a southern plantation, although it was a significant difference. As this image, it's the earliest image we have of her, reflects, she was, she's wearing a Quaker bonnet there. She was raised a Quaker. On instructions from the Quaker hierarchy, when she was a young teenager, her father sold the family slaves and moved to Philadelphia and tried to start a business there. His business failed, but Dolly flourished. Uh, she was tall for the time. She had an hourglass figure, a mischievous smile. You could sometimes see it in her uh, images, almost all of them. Uh, black hair, creamy complexion, blue eyes, and liked her. 
Men liked her a lot. And I always like to point out that say what you will about James Madison's small stature, his receding hairline, his uh, social reserve and awkwardness. Of all the founders, he had the hottest wife. <laughs> now, Dolly married a Quaker lawyer. She had a first marriage and had two sons with him. But her husband and one son died in a yellow fever epidemic in 1793. As a single mother, she was in great demand. She did not want for suitors at all. But one of the most ardent was James Madison. And the story is that he saw her either on the street or uh, at some social event and essentially said, who is that woman? And learned who she was and arranged for his, discovered that his good friend from college, Aaron Burr, had, was renting a room from her mother. So he arranged for Aaron Burr to introduce them. Uh, and he was 17 years older. That was not viewed as a great obstacle in those days. I'm not sure it does, it, it is today either. Um, and on the occasion of that first meeting, I love the note that Dolly sent to a friend that afternoon, which reveals both her playful nature and, and her sophistication. Because um, she writes to her friend that she is going to meet the great little Madison. And she really captures him. Because of course he is short, he's balding. Um, but he also was great. He was a national figure, politically, leader of the Republican Party. He was wealthy, he was kind, he was intelligent. In a Jane Austen era when the match you made had meant was so important for a woman's life, you could do a great deal worse than James Madison. And studying their relationship was a delight in many ways. Uh, I was able to see a side of Madison that you just don't get. You know, the political philosophers have sort of drained the life out of him to some extent. Um, I discovered that he could be flirtatious. His few letters to Dolly, they, they were very rarely apart, but he, they, he did write some letters to her. They're warm and loving long after the first infatuation uh, would have cooled. Um, and the accounts of his flirtatiousness are kind of surprising. There's a period in his first administration, his first term in presidency, when Dolly's widowed sister Lucy moved into the White House with her children and lived there for several years. Um, Madison, according to these accounts, delighted in kissing Dolly in front of her sister and asking whether it made her sister's mouth water. <laughs> I'll admit it's a little creepy, um, but that's not the way you've ever thought about James Madison. Another aspect that was fun to learn about was that although the Madisons never had children of their own and are sometimes imagined as this semi-sad childless couple, usually had a house that was overrun with children. They had dozens of nieces and nephews, upwards of 50 as near as I can tell, and they were often with them for weeks on end, sometimes months. Uh, friends would send their children to stay with them for a long period, particularly when they were in the White House, and Dolly would always see that the young ladies were introduced to suitable potential uh, matches. Uh, it's also often missed that the Madisons were a lot of fun. In small groups, James was quick with a quip and humorous anecdote. He was reported to keep the table in stitches. Dolly was always vivacious and engaging. A niece called her a foe to dullness. One of the entertaining stories is on the front porch at Mont Montpelier, and you can see in this image that it's, it's not a huge front porch, but apparently Dolly and James would run races against each other. Uh, it was in their retirement, so they weren't looking for a long uh, racetrack. But it gives you a feel for the spirit they had with each other. Indeed, there is an account that in retirement, Dolly, who was always a bit uh, taller than James and became a good bit 
uh, wider than James, uh, would load him on her back and carry him around the mansion. <laughs> but I want to emphasize that their fun had a purpose. Through James's eight years as Secretary of State and eight as President, Dolly set a bright social tone. I, mean, I, I like this image to give you a feel for sort of Dolly Madison in her flower. Um, she was gay, she was gracious, she always sought out the most awkward, uncomfortable person in the room and to put him or her at their ease. She understood the need to provide glamour and charisma to the government, which, again, was not something James could do. As wife of the president, and she was called at the time sometimes the lady presidentess, we didn't use the term first lady yet, um, she took to wearing turbans, uh, either of velvet or silk, and she would stick uh, flowers uh, or, or, or fruit at the top of the turban. Um, the result was that in a big crowded room, uh, you always knew where Dolly was. Uh, you could miss James very easily, but Dolly was, was visible. Uh, she had a famous exchange with Henry Clay, which may have been apocryphal when he was a good friend of hers. They played cards together. They took snuff together. And he is reported once to have said, everyone loves Mrs. Madison. And she, of course, responded, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everybody. And it wasn't, strictly speaking, true. She actually was better at keeping a grudge than James was. <laughs> but it seemed to be true. And as we know in politics, that's far more important than what is true. Uh, the Madisons freely mixed foreigners and far Federalists and Republicans producing a social swirl that allowed the sinews of policy and politics to form in an informal setting. Sometimes that's a terribly valuable uh, opportunity. Office seekers would come to Dolly and ask her to intercede with the president to get jobs, and as near as we can tell, she was pretty good at it. In fact, she really was a political partner, always a loyal and sure-footed one, who not only warmed his private life, but also helped him forge a new Republican style for the nation. Indeed, the losing Federalist candidate in 1808 claimed that he had lost to Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance had I faced Mr. Madison alone. <laughs> now, many of you will recall Dolly's shining moment during the War of 1812, which came actually on James's worst day, probably of his entire career. In late August of 1814, the British Army had been dis uh, disembarked from ships in the Chesapeake Bay, marched on Washington. There was a very brief skirmish at Bladensburg, uh, sometimes referred to at the time as the Bladensburg Races because our militia ran so quickly. <laughs> Madison had actually gone to the battlefield to try to rally the troops and inspire them, but it just, as I said, was not something he was going to be able to do, and the militia wasn't really going to ever be inspired anyway. So the British marched into Washington, and they burned the public buildings. This is a black mark on his presidency, which sometimes, I think, has caused him to be underestimated over the years. But there was a shining moment, which is right before the British got there, Dolly, who had to flee, remembered to take down the portrait of George Washington. We were a republic. We were not a monarchy. We didn't have crown jewels. but we did cherish the memory of George Washington. And this was a presence of mind, a spirit, a redoubtable attitude, which was much valued through the country. James Madison was reviled by many of his countrymen after the burning of Washington's public buildings. He was called a coward repeatedly. But people kept a warm spot in their hearts for Dolly. Now, their retirement at Montpelier was generally a happy one, but a dark cloud formed increasingly over it. He lived for almost, James lived for almost 20 years in retirement. 
He lived to be 85. From a fellow who was sick most, much of his life, it was a surprise to him that he lived so long. And that dark shadow was slavery. I was struck that it is so rarely remarked upon that Madison's grandfather was poisoned to death by his own slave. This is an episode that Madison never commented on, and one has to assume was not really talked about at Montpelier. Madison often lived there with five or six or seven other white people and about 100 black slaves. But I think we can assume also that all of the white people and all of the black people knew that story. And it created a very corrosive environment. Madison's feelings about slavery intellectually were purely of abhorrence. As a young man, he struggled with the contradictions between his own commitment to human liberty and the fact that he lived on the labor of slaves. He bought land in upstate New York. And he wrote a friend that he hoped to move there and never to rely upon the labor of slaves. He didn't do it. We don't know exactly why. The pull of his family, the pull of his success. It seems to me, as he gets into the core of his public career, he is able to put these feelings about slavery aside. And he simply doesn't confront them. But then, in retirement, he can't look away anymore. It's there every day at Montpelier. It's all around him. And he's living into an era, the Missouri Compromise, the rise of abolitionism, the Nat Turner Rebellion in 1831. 160 people are slaughtered as part of that rebellion. He now can see what he's always predicted as a young man, he predicted that slavery was the one thing that could tear the nation apart, and now he can see that it's coming. And he almost compulsively tries to figure out a way out of the box. How do we fix slavery? And he's a creature of intellect more on policy issues. He figured out how to set up a government. He figured out how to take on the British, and he wants to figure out slavery. And he, he's writes memos to himself. Well, we can sell off all the land out west that's owned by the government, and we'll use that money to pay the slave owners. But we have to get the slaves out of the country because prejudice is so bad that they, they'll have terrible lives if they stay here. We'll just have more violence. So we have to then get them over to Africa or South America or anywhere else. And it's a poignant, terrible, disturbing spectacle, this great statesman grappling with this issue that he can't solve because he is failing to see it for what it really is, which is a failure of the human heart, that it is the race prejudice at its core that is why he can't solve it. Indeed, one of the sort of pathetic things he does this is at Montpelier. They're, if you've visited, and I encourage you to, they've done a wonderful job restoring his place. Um, they are reconstructing slave cabins he built late in his life. It was customary, of course, to have your slaves live somewhere where nobody could see them because you know, they didn't live very nicely. Uh, they were kept in, in poor conditions. Well, Madison built essentially a Potemkin village of slave cottages. Uh, he got tired of having Northerners and Europeans come and lecture him about slavery. So he built these nice slave cabins. They were sort of duplexes with glass windows, excuse me, uh, and, and, you know, hung doors. And it was to show people that slavery wasn't so bad. And it's pretty sad, frankly, that that was the best he was able to manage. He never did free any of his slaves. Indeed, uh, Dolly, despite her Quaker background, leaves not a word spoken ever about slavery. So we don't actually know what she thought either. In his final years, 
James became increasingly decrepit. I love this image of him just two years before he died. He spent his days in his dressing gown and nightcap. He really lived in two rooms at Montpelier. But his mind remained bright, his intellect sharp. These years were hard on Dolly. She had to take care of him all the time. She wrote once that his hands and fingers are still so swelled and sore as to be nearly useless, but I lend him mine. He could always be happy with ideas, or at least occupied with ideas in newspapers and books. She needed people, and it was hard for her to be isolated without them. When he died in 1836 at the age of 85, she moved back to Washington City and re-entered the social world. And we got this wonderful blessing, which is she lived long enough to have her photograph taken. <laughs> this is taken just, just a year or so before she died in the Zachary Taylor administration. Uh, her re-entry into Washington social life was greatly applauded. She had a wonderful time for a few years, but then the money ran out. She had many gifts, but thrift was not among them. Financial management was not among them. She had her own son, Madison's stepson, who was a bit of a wastrel and uh, burned up a lot of money, too. She ended up in a sort of genteel poverty with only a couple of slaves who were sold upon her death. Now, having held forth on two of Madison's productive partnerships, or just one of them, actually. I want to close with a note about Madison himself. I do think he was able to form these partnerships because of who he was. He was not the dry creature of intellect that we sometimes think of. He was referred to by a contemporary as, I've never seen so much mind in so little matter. <laughs> um, but he had a genuineness and an integrity and open-heartedness. These qualities for me shine through in the way he received the news of the Treaty of Ghent, which is the agreement that ended the War of 1812. As I said, he pushed the nation into war, and it didn't go terribly well much of the time. It's February 13, 1815, just about 200 years before now. He's actually living in Octagon House, which still stands over on 17th Street. A rumor arrives that the treaty has been signed with Britain, and a Pennsylvania senator rushes to Octagon House to ask Madison if it's true. Let me just read a short passage from the book. The senator found the house dark, the president sitting solitary in his parlor, in perfect tranquility, not even a servant in waiting. The senator asked if the rumor was true. Madison bade him sit down. I will tell you all I know, he said then confirmed that he thought there was peace, but he had no official confirmation. The senator recalled with some wonder what he called the president's self-command on the occasion and greatness of mind. The War of 1812 truly had been Mr. Madison's war, as his opponents called it. It was about principles, not gain. It was fought with a quiet tenacity, sometimes ineptly, and with endless tolerance of those who opposed it. As a friend of Madison's wrote years later, the war had been conducted in perfect keeping with the character of the president, of whom it may be said that no one had to a greater extent firmness, mildness, and self-possession. And when peace came, Madison welcomed it in a darkened house alone with his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions, but it's great if you could make your way to one of the uh, microphones. Thank you for that informative presentation. In the dim recesses of my memory, I remember writing a paper in college. I think it was about a landmark case. Was it Marbury versus Madison? <laughs> Can, Can you refresh my memory? I don't recall any specifics. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's kind of an accident that his name is on the case. It was because he was Secretary of State. The case involved 
the midnight judges of John Adams. At the very end of Adams' administration, he knows Jefferson's going to take office. He appoints a bunch of judges uh, in the last 24 hours before he leaves office. And they are not able to take their commissions and have them confirmed and take office. So when Jefferson becomes president, these judges show up. And, and Mr. Marbury was to be a, some sort of officer in the District of Columbia. Uh, they go to the Secretary of State and say, okay, here's our commission. We are now in, the, in office. And Madison said, no, you're not. And they brought suit, saying they were entitled to the office. This ends up, it takes two years to litigate. God bless the lawyers. Um, and it ends up before Chief Justice Marshall, who actually rules in Madison's favor and in favor of Jefferson, saying these judges can't take office. But he does so on such a technicality. And after basically holding that the courts have the right to judge the constitutionality of every federal statute, that Jefferson hates the ruling. So I'm pretty sure my federal jurisdiction professor would be appalled by that description of the case. But that's a quick description. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks also for a, a wonderful presentation. You stressed the, the rigor of Madison's intellect. How was that intellect formed? What was his formal education, where and how? Uh, he was sent away to a, a secondary school, uh, which he resided at. He, he was largely, largely taught by Scots, which in America was, in that era, was the best way to be taught. Um, there were a lot of Scots uh, who had come over uh, looking for opportunity, who were very well educated and were fine instructors. He then did not do what most Virginia uh, young gentlemen would do, which was to go to the College of William and Mary. His family sent him to Princeton, which was also run by Scots. Uh, this had two effects. It put him in the uh, influence group of John Witherspoon, who was president of the school at the time, and other instructors there who were very engaged with the Scottish Enlightenment. It also exposed him to non-Virginia culture in a terribly important way. I think it was a very formative experience for him. And you know, all these Scots were Presbyterians. They were actually a minority at the time, and a somewhat discriminated against minority. And I think it gave him a heightened sense of what how minorities can be picked on by majorities. So it was a terribly important experience. He finished Princeton in two years, even though it was supposed to be a three or four year course, um, and then stayed for a, a third year of sort of graduate study, worked himself into a, a breakdown. And the rest of his life, his intellectual self-discipline is kind of staggering. He would, he, the year before the Constitutional Convention, he basically trained himself to be a lawyer. He would never practiced law. He would, didn't have any need to or interest in it. But he knew he had to understand law to do what he wanted to do with setting up the government. So he just read everything there was to know about British and uh, civil law. Uh, he always had this ability, but just the incredible powers of concentration. He was very obsessive about his work. He did tend to work himself sick. Uh, that was a pattern also in his life. Yes. Thank you. Um, the founders uh, were opposed to a standing army, and they preferred state militias. With respect to the Second Amendment, from your, from your research and from your background, uh, would Madison's interpretation of the Second Amendment be in conformity with the Heller case? Uh, it's not an easy question to answer. Let me answer something easier first, uh, which is okay, the okay. attitude towards a standing army. You're exactly right. They terribly mistrusted it, as did Madison. It was his attitude. Uh, and when he was president during the War of 1812, he discovered, in fact, the militia was a lousy way to fight a war, that you know, we had militia who, when we wanted to invade Canada, they'd just stop at the border and say, I didn't sign up for that. Um, and they were not well trained by definition. They could not stand up to British regulars. 
Uh, and at the end of the war, with his first budget after the war, he says to Congress, he issues, uh, sends a statement in his budget and says, we do need to have an army. We were, I was wrong. You really do need an army. So he was, his opinion was changed on that subject. The question of the Second Amendment is not an easy one because he never commented on it. He had no reason to. Uh, it was never a disputed subject in his lifetime. So you're just left with the text of the amendment. It wasn't really debated in Congress when the Second Amendment goes through Congress. We only have records from the House because the Senate met in secret in those days, and we have nothing for what they did. My sense is that there's so much about the modern world that Madison could not have imagined, um, that the proliferation of guns in an urban society would surprise him. He grew up on the frontier, a, a society that had guns and needed guns. There were Indian scares around his house when he was a boy. Um, there was violence everywhere. The French and Indian War was in his childhood. Uh, so he did not have a negative attitude about guns. Uh, and would he feel the same way today? It's hard to say. I, I think we can't do much better, frankly, than fall back on the language of the amendment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, if, if you don't mind, I, I'd just like to add an addendum to your response to the question about Marbury versus Madison, because I think it's probably one of the three or four most important cases that the Supreme Court ever decided in 1806, because it laid the foundation for the continued power of the Supreme Court right up to today to declare acts of Congress and federal treaties and everything that the states do, if they're ever challenged in the courts, unconstitutional. The Supreme Court's original jurisdiction, excuse me, Congress had passed the Judiciary Act of 1789, which was the act under which Marbury brought his suit. In that act, Congress expanded the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which otherwise is provided for only in the Constitution. We need to stick with Madison here. Pardon me? <laughs> So, well, it, this is about Marbury versus Madison, so it is about Madison. But it is a very ext extremely important case. It is absolutely and possibly the most important. I, I would also emphasize that it was anticipated very much by uh, Hamilton's Federalist Paper, number 78, which does also talk about judicial review. I think it was not an unanticipated outcome. I think many of the framers intended it. Do you have a question? Yes, Doc Stewart, uh, witty, fascinating. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, two quick ones. First, Dolly, uh, and then uh, Madison for a quick one. Did uh, Dolly uh, grow uh, birthplace and grow up which southern plantation? In Virginia or was further south? Uh, just for curiosity. Yeah, I'm, I wish you hadn't asked. Um, there's, <laughs> there's arguments about this. Um, North Carolina puts in a claim for her. Um, I found only uh, evidence of Virginia locations. It's not even clear if her father owned the plantations or if he was a manager or was leasing the plantations. Um, it's, it's not clear. Okay, uh, then uh, she had to have been a mentor and idol, so to speak, for a number of women in her day because uh, yes. of her pluck and her wit. And that, that's just fascinating what she did. Madison himself, uh, the, the main thing besides that's brilliance and his influence, which n doesn't get there with uh, the other greats. Uh, but uh, did uh, he ever cross paths with Franklin, Benjamin Franklin? I didn't understand your Did the word. Madison ever cross paths with Ben Franklin? Very much. Did Madison cross paths with Ben Franklin? Yes. Uh, certainly during the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and he made a, a, a point of uh, cultivating Franklin. He went to Franklin's house many times during the convention and basically would sit at his, at his knee and, and ask him questions and listen to him and have him tell stories. Uh, he admired him tremendously. Uh, he was young enough to be Franklin's grandson. Yeah. Uh, there was a big age difference, but uh, it, it was somebody he valued. They were never peers, of course, but for that one period, they did have uh, a lot of contact. Yes, yeah. thank you much. You bet. And last question here. I wondered uh, if you uh, thought that um, 
uh, a, a Slave in the White House by Paul Jennings yes. gives much light to it. Can you comment on that at all? Well, the question relates to, there was a book a couple of years ago, Slave in the White House, which includes the recollections of Paul Jennings, uh, who was Madison's valet uh, uh, in the White House, a very young man. Uh, he became a, uh, a slave to the Madisons when he was about eight. Uh, and uh, ultimately bought his way out of slavery with Dolly after James died using money that was loaned to him by Daniel Webster. Uh, and he became a free man and a, 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 a self-supporting individual here. His family descendants still live in the area. Uh, and it, it, it's an impressive story about Jennings, again, a disappointing story about the Madisons, uh, that uh, the only way out was to buy your way out. Thank you very much.